Okay guys, so in this lecture, we're gonna cover cardiac pharmacology. So uh, this is really designed to be essentially a crash course in, in cardiac pharmacology. One for starters, similar to cardiac surgery and interventional cardiology, uh, we won't be prescribing medications to patients, but you need to be aware of like what they do and their implications on uh, exercise responses and, and how it impacts human movement, right? So. Uh, you have it, you know, in our course you'll have, or in our curriculum, you'll have an entire semester on pharmacology. So we're not going to spend a ton of time, but these are things that come up quite often in cardio poems. So we have to cover some basics to see you have an understanding of what, kind of what these things are. So um, my objectives, again, we'll go over the basics of pharmacokinetics. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this, uh, just again, because you have an entire, you have an entire course on cardiac pharmacology. So this is just a brief introduction. We'll go over some of the common side effects and common medications that you'll see in patients uh, with different cardiovascular disease. So I think just to kind of bear in mind, um, you know, we've got our, our major risk factors for heart disease and, and cardiovascular disease. We have those non-modifiable risk factors. So uh, gender really should be more, I guess, probably really more sex than just gender, um, you know, male sex versus female sex. Um, age, male over 40, female over 50, and then your race or ethnicity. Obviously can't change these. And really race is an intersection with race and, and, um, and society. But these are non-modifiable risk factors, right? These aren't things people can change um, individually. Then we have modifiable risk factors, right? So um, you know, these are, again, these are by definition from the AHA and other societies that the hypertension being a big one, tobacco use, um, you know, diabetes or elevated blood glucose, inactivity, over, being overweight or obese, or cholesterol. So a lot of our medications are gonna be designed to address some of these modifiable risk factors and in hypertension medications um, and cholesterol medications being a big one as well as uh, diabetic medications. So again, the first line of treatment is always from, from you know, even physicians is lifestyle modifications, getting patients to eat healthier, be a little bit more active, again, eat a little less, move a little bit more, eat a little bit, you know, healthier foods, maintain a healthy weight, stopping smoking. Honestly, if you looked at, you know, if you, if we had probably one of the, probably the worst things we can do to our bodies overall is smoking like that, that there's, there's really not much good that comes from it. Um, and a lot of bad that comes along with it, um, including cardiovascular disease, cancers, and, and other issues. Um, moderating alcohol consumption, right? Uh, managing stress, right? So these are the things we recommend to our patients. I like this kind of analogy from, from The Simpsons, you know, die, die it, right? And he screams a little bit louder, but that's the first line of intervention. Well, the thing I, I, I want to stress, right? And, and we often kind of get caught up into this. Well, you know, everyone just needs to diet. Everyone just needs to move a little bit more and they'll solve everything. They can cure their disease. Well, that, 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 that's great in a perfect world, right? That's great that everyone could, you know, do these things and be healthier, sure. Um, but like, what do you do in the meantime, right? Do they you just allow that person to stay in an emergent hypertension or uncontrolled diabetes? No, right? Sometimes the, the lifestyle you know, modifications aren't enough to manage the risk factors or overt disease. So we may need medications to lower the LDL cholesterol, to lower their blood pressure, lower their blood sugar and prevent blood clots and stuff like that. While we're still encouraging lifestyle modifications, like just being on meds isn't the end, right? Like it's it's a it's a you know we should almost be viewing it as a bridge, right, to keep people alive, so we can work to get them healthier, right? And that this is not a failed case. We shouldn't view medications as someone's failed healthy living interventions. No, like it it might not be enough alone, so we might need a little bit of help. And medications basically are that they help us manage um, disease or risk factors for disease uh, that we can't manage right now, or that we need a little bit more time. Uh, to manage. So I just want to, you know, dispel that, that narrative or how, you know, a lot of people in, in the field of rehab view medications. Um, it's not, it's not a, we're, we're not, it's not a dichotomous thing. And obviously there's issues with how some meds are overprescribed, but um, again, it, they work in concert with healthy living interventions too. Now, we'll touch briefly on major routes of administration. There's oral, intravenous, intramuscular, subcutaneous, sublingual, and rectal. So oral, we, we swallow a pill. IV, injected into your vein. Um, intramuscular, injected into your muscle. Subcutaneous, it's injected in just into the skin. Sublingual, under the tongue. And then there's rectal suppositories. They all have different 
um, effects um, or different speeds of absorption. You'll learn more about this. Uh, the reason why uh, you know, we touched on these different routes of administration is that de depending on how you intake a medication will affect how it's metabolized. If we swallow a pill, it has to pass through the, the GI system, it has to pass through the liver uh, before it gets out into the systemic circulation to act on tissue, right? So you gotta, it's gotta pass through your GI system, which passes through uh, then, you know, the, the, you know, the, all that, uh, processing in the GI system, it'll move through the, the portal system in the liver and then, and then enter the systemic circulation. So th throughout that process, while it's in the intestine, while it goes through the, you know, the, the, the liver, um, it's going to be metabolized. We call this the first pass metabolism, right? Where we eliminate some of the drug before it gets into the systemic circulation. Um, this is really relevant for those oral medications because they have to go through the GI system. You know, maybe if we want to um, bypass that, we might do that IV medication. We might do a different approach, a sublingual approach, depending on, on the person. Um, but any oral medication, you know, the concentrations are always a little bit, they're not as exact because everyone's metabolism is a little bit different. Everyone's liver functions a little bit different. Uh, so some people may clear things out a little bit more than other people. So we got to be careful um, with, you know, how we titrate medications. If we ever want something to get really quickly into the bloodstream and act on tissue, often we'll do that IV medication because it doesn't go through that first pass um, you know, elimination or first pass metabolism. <clears throat> um, and that's why, you know, so many medications, you know, we're always concerned about the liver because it, 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 if you're swallowing a pill, it's going to pass through the liver too. Uh, Half-Life, not the video game, which I have referenced up there, um, is the other thing to consider. Most um, medications are what we call first order meds that the, the rate of process depends on the amount of drug presence. So the, the effect of the drug is due to this concentration in the blood. Um, and we talked about first pass metabolism, which eliminates um, some of the drug before it even gets into the circulation and then gets to a tissue. There are some drugs like you know, their half-life or how long it takes for 50%, right, of it to be, um, you know, for it to go through its process, right? So for it to kind of break down and, and, and do its thing. So we go through first pass metabolism. Half-life is basically how long it stays kind of potent. Um, it's the way, to, the way to think about it for 50% of the first order process to be complete. So if you have a drug with a very short half-life, it will get to, you can think of it as 50% of a, its effect a lot faster, right? So some drugs like nitroglycerin have a very short half-life. It's like three minutes. Um, and there are some maybe longer acting drugs where their half-life is a little bit longer, takes a little bit longer from the breakdown. They can still act on tissue a little bit longer, right? So um, those factor into the active um, or the pharmacokinetics or the effect of medications. Uh, first path metabolism is a big one, the half-life of the medication. And our goal is uh, when we're prescribing a med that we never want the concentrations in the, in the blood and the plasma, particularly when we measure it, to, to go all the way to zero. We never want that to happen, we, you know, especially for a chronic use. We want them to say the thing we call steady state, where the rate of clearance and the rate of absorption um, are kind of balanced, right? That we're keeping things stable. We don't have these large fluctuations in the concentration of that medication um, in the blood, so the effects are fairly constant. Um, when we have large fluctuations in concentration, when we're going up and down, up and down, peaks and valleys, that's not good for the body. That's that they're going to have some compl you're going to have more side effects that way. Our goal is to keep things in a steady state, where again concentration stays, you know, fairly consistent, and then we get to a plateau point, and it, we we hover or oscillate around that point. We don't want you know, this to go super high up, super high down, super high up, super high down. And um, this is actually a big problem in managing patients that if they skip a medication, sometimes there's rebound effects um, from letting a concentration of a drug drop and then, you know, waiting a day or two and then taking another one, it skyrockets. You can have all kinds of uh, complications. So our goal is to keep concentrations fairly consistent. And we talked about the difference between um, intravenous and oral um, cause you know, and, and this is relevant because some drugs go through almost a complete metabolism 
you know, that, you know, that, for, that they have a very short half-life um, and they are metabolized by different enzymes in the body um, even before they get, like, even before they get to the blood, right? So a, a classic example of that is nitroglycerin, incredibly short half-life. Um, so it has to almost typically be given or it can't be given orally. Like you can't like take a pill for it because if they swallow it, it would be completely extracted before ever getting to the body. So nitroglycerin is either given sub sublingually. So it's you know quickly absorbed into the bloodstream or it's given through an IV. It's almost never given um, just orally uh, because of how quickly it's, it's broken down. And then we've got uh, temporal characteristics of drug effects. So there's always going to be a little lag present before the drugs get to their peak effect. Um, again, um, you know, there's going to be a little ramp up time after we take a medication. And then we get to the peak effect. Our goal is to keep patients, again, within that tight window, we call the minimum effective concentration, right? We don't want them to dip below that um, so we can still keep the effects of the medication. And we don't want to go above it when we start getting into higher risk for complications because we're over, you're giving too much medication, right? Again, the problem is if patients like take double meds for a certain thing or take medications off a schedule, we can mess around with that MEC. And then we have more a higher risk for having the you know, toxicity of that of that medication or really bad side effects. So again, you'll learn a lot more about this um, later on. Uh, but our goal typically with meds is to get them to that you know that peak effect or that that MEC range um, and to keep them within that range. So most of your meds are timed, you know, bef- to be given on a schedule where we you know we catch them before they, the, the, the downs, the downslope moves below the MEC. So that's why you might see some meds are every four hours. Some meds are every six hours, right? They're, they're, they have different temporal characteristics um, and you should be following them. Don't, don't take them off the off schedule. Um, and next we'll cover a little bit of physiology review. So we've got receptors on all of our membranes, which um, again, from physiology, you know, we've got, um, they're embedded into membranes, right? And they extend both from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell and facilitates communication um, from you know, both inside and outside the cell. Um, they also have those G proteins, which causes a secondary effect in the cell. Remember those secondary messenger processes. A lot of our drugs really act on, or act on those receptors. And we'll talk about the two different approaches that we can utilize to uh, change the processes of a cell. So. Uh, the receptors are really what we're targeting for most of our meds. Um, and again, these are usually proteins, again, embedded into the cell membrane that cause, they have those G proteins, which cause a secondary effect in the cell, um, which leads to some other different process. Now, the, the two general approaches we have are, uh, are receptor bonding. We've got agonism or antagonism, right? So agonists, they bind specifically, the agonists, activates a, a cell function. An antagonist um, will bind specifically as well, but it will block an agonist, right? Um, and does not influence cell function or stops that cell function. Now within antagonism, there are two types of antagonism. There is non-competitive, which we bind to the allosteric region. So it's not the active receptor site. It's a site that uh, if we bind to it, prevents binding to the active site, right? So an allosteric site, if you bond to that, it's non-competitive. We're not competing for the same receptor. We're bonding to the allosteric site, you know, of the, of the, receptor, of the receptor to prevent it from getting or taking on um, or pre- preventing other, you know, hormones from, from, or other chemicals from bonding to that receptor. So. We're not competing for the receptor. We're just preventing, you know, it from being activated from, you know, the typical, you know, um, agonists. Now, competitive antagonist binds to the same site as the agonist on the receptor. So it's binding on that receptor. Does not activate it, though, but it's now blocking the agonist. So it's taking up space. So it's competing for the same site. So we call that a competitive antagonist. It still prevents activation. Both of them do the same thing. They shut down 
that cellular process, but a non-competitive is not competing for the same sites, it's preventing the agonist from bonding because through bond by you know attaching itself to the allosteric site, which causes a, a biochemical change in the receptor to prevent the agonist from binding. A competitive is just blocking. It's going to the same site and preventing that agonist from ever getting there. And then we have drug selectivity, right? So we've got selective drugs, non-selective drugs. Selective drugs are where we have meds that really go to a specific receptor and have a very specific effect. Um, they typically have lower amounts of side effects because um, what you'll notice with a lot of our meds, like we've got, for example, you know, our, our adrenergic receptors are throughout our entire body. They bond everywhere. Um, there's you know, a, a multitude of different cells. Well, maybe we want to do stuff to reduce sympathetic nervous system activity. Um, well, we could use a um, we could use a, a selective drug that just only goes to a particular type of receptors. Now, there are non-selective drugs that will get to the you know, maybe tissues or organ systems with the same receptors that we don't want to block, right? So, you know, for example, we may want to only block beta-1 receptors, right, in the heart to slow down the heart rate. But there are maybe beta-1 receptors or beta-2 receptors elsewhere throughout the body, which, you know, a non-selective drug might bind to, which will cause other effects. So selective drugs really go to one tissue. Non-selective will, you know, go to receptors in other tissue as well, and maybe even related or similar uh, types of receptors that are not exactly the same. So classic example, again, beta blockers. We've got those beta receptors in the heart. We also have beta receptors in the lungs, and sometimes we can have pulmonary issues um, when we're trying to treat cardiac issues. So drug selectivity also matters because we don't just have receptors for one, you know, with one type in one organ. They're kind of diffusely. Uh, throughout the body. So there's been a bigger push to get these more selective drugs to be used to reduce the risk of side effects by, you know, activating or deactivating um, cells in different, in different tissues. Now, again, all medications have side effects. Again, hypertension meds often cause dizziness, orthostasis. Um, so we always need to keep in mind that these side effects can be present when we're working for our patients. And next, we'll get into some more common meds you'll see in PT practice, uh, most notably hypertension medications, anticoagulant medications, and then some uh, glucose medications or diabetes medications.